This morning, let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 23. Genesis 23, as many of you are well aware, we have been making our way through the life of Abraham, and today we approach Genesis 23. Many of you know, uh, maybe I mentioned this uh, last week, I thought of trying to conclude this series today, but as I examined uh, the chapters that I kind of wanted to talk about, uh, I'm going to plan to have one more Sunday, so it'll be the Sunday after next, Lord willing, if the Lord tarries and God allows me to, uh, we will uh, plan to conclude Abraham's life uh, then. But today in Genesis chapter 23, the subject of this message, in our text, we will encounter the death of a loved one. You know, over the last number of months here at Lebanon, our congregation has experienced the death of many loved ones. As uh, your pastor, there has been different times, seasons of death that I've had to Uh, navigate through here as a pastor at Lebanon and at other places. In fact, I think the first week I was a pastor here, uh, there was a death within our congregation. I remember one of the first phone calls I ever got, even as a pastor, when I was a youth pastor in Charlotte, a late night call came from one of my sponsors who was in, uh, in tears, just explaining that she had just learned that her brother had committed suicide. And I immediately as a pastor had to help this person deal with the tragedy of death. I'm looking at a congregation in which numbers of you have had to navigate death on numbers of different fronts. Our congregation has had to deal with murders, drownings, suicides, horrible accidents, disease. This is just things that I've learned as I've talked with numbers of you. It has struck our parents. Some of you, it struck your children. Many of you, it struck your spouses. And for all of us, we've lost friends. As I stand in many ways at midlife, The closest family members that I've lost have been really grandparents up to this point. I lost an uncle this past February, right before COVID really hit. And I know the sensitivity when you lose someone close to you of uh, just continuing to reflect on death. I know for my parents, by this time in their life, my parents had lost a lot more of their family. My mom, as I think I've mentioned to you, lost her mom when she was six years old. Uh, her mom, my grandmother, died of breast cancer at the age of 23. I told you about my dad a while back, how uh, I think he was the age of 12 when he lost his older brother at 14 to drowning. My dad lost his dad before he was my age. And he had to navigate all of those different situations. Some of you here today, me just mentioning death and loved ones, the sting of death is incredibly real to you. And it always will be, this side of heaven. One reality on our journey of life is our experience of death. It will continue to hit closer and closer and closer to us till finally it strikes us itself. Today, we are going to see how Abraham, the main character in this particular text, a man of faith, navigates the death of a loved one. In fact, his dearest, his dear wife, Sarah. And it points to us, really, and shouts to us a lesson that I believe all of us need to learn, and it's this. God's people can live by faith in the face of death. Let me repeat that. God's people can live by faith in the face of death. My hope is that all of you who know Christ, when you have to go through this particular journey, 
that you would do it by faith with an eye on eternity. What you'll find in our text is that Abraham sees beyond this life and so must you. For the original readers of Genesis, the nation of Israel coming out of the wandering of of the wilderness, they were people who had experienced death. Many of you know because they didn't enter the land when they were supposed to, God judged them and said all the people over a certain age were going to pass away in the wilderness. I recounted to you in our First Corinthians series how that, that, that generation probably, if you were to calculate the amount of people who died in the wilderness, they were experiencing about seven funerals an hour during daylight for 38 years. They knew about death. Here they read about how a man of faith navigates death. This morning, I want to give you simply two truths that are going to support this. And one is is not going to take you hard to grasp, and it's this. God's people will encounter death. We will. Our text begins with the statement of Sarah's death. Look what it says, Genesis 23, verse 1 and 2. It says, Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah, and Sarah died in Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Cana. So here's Sarah, Abraham's wife, who lived 127 years. Interesting note is she's the only woman in our Bible whose age is given when she passed away. She appears to have died prematurely or possibly unexpectedly. Abraham was 10 years older than her and would live another 38 years. So 48 years past her age. Yes, she was able to enjoy her son Isaac who came late in life for 37 years. He was 37 when she passed away. As we think about Sarah and her legacy, her life, of course she had her moments of failure, didn't she? We have them recorded for us in our Bible. Aren't you glad that a lot of our failures aren't necessarily recorded for all the generations to read about? She messed up. She suggested her husband sleep with her servant Hagar to produce a seed for them. She ran Hagar out of town out of her anger and frustration. When God promised that she was going to have a child... She laughed at God's promise, even in the presence of the Lord. You know what? It's easy for us to focus on her failures. But then take a moment and think about her faith. She did follow Abraham to Ur, I mean from Ur, to a land that she had never seen before. Her, Her husband said, God's told me to do this, and she goes with him. She lives in a tent. Basically, her entire life is a foreigner in a strange place. She followed her husband through thick and thin. She dealt with barrenness, which some of you have gone through. She dealt with it for decades of her life and the reproach that was the the result of it. Two crowning statements of Sarah's life was this. When she finally had Isaac, what does she say? God has made me laugh. She realized that the reason she had a child was who did it? God did. God is sovereign over all things. And when the writer of Hebrews gives his last testimony of her, this is what he says about Sarah. By faith, Sarah herself. She received power to conceive even when she was past the age. And listen to this. Since she considered God, him, faithful who had promised. She believed in her God. She trusted in her God. She had faith in her God. You know what? At the end of the day, when you and I, when our date comes, all of us with a date of death, when it finally arrives, let me remind you that it isn't going to be your failures that define you. It is going to be your faith in God. 
Have you believed in God? You in here may look at your life and look at all the things that you have done, the ways you've messed up. You may look at yourself as a colossal failure. But when you place your faith in Jesus Christ and believe in your God, that makes all the difference in the world. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Believe in him. And we know where Sarah is today. What does the Bible say? To be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. And she is with the Lord. But as a reminder to all of you, your death date, and I don't think any of you are going to make it to 127, okay? Your death date is coming. And you just breathed a breath that was one breath closer to that date. And you better prepare for it by faith. Neither is there salvation in any other. There is one way that you will be able to spend time eternity with God, and that is through his son, Jesus Christ. And if you are here today and death has always haunted you and brought fear into your life, there is someone who can take away the fear of death. And that is Jesus Christ who can save your soul and transform your life. Believe in him. It is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. And if you will accept Christ, he'll take the judgment for you. So Sarah passes away, but now we run into the mourning of Abraham. Those of you who have lost a spouse, Find in Abraham one who's gone through it. Listen to what it says. Look at the end of verse 2. It says, And Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. Now notice it says went in. You know what it suggests? It suggests that he possibly wasn't there when she passed. Maybe he was out in the field farming or or doing something in reference to his herds and cattle. Maybe he was away in Beersheba. You know, it is so often the case that those of us who have to say goodbye to our loved ones don't get to do it in person. Don't get to be right there with her. He mourned for her, and the Bible says he wept for her. Here was a man in which no tears, now it's interesting, Here's a man in which no tears are recorded for leaving his homeland or for the death of his father, because he has to deal with the death of his father. No necessary tears for the sacrifice of his son. But when his companion of life, when Sarah, his dear wife, crossed over, what does the Bible say? He wept. Those of you who've gone through sorrow, Know the feelings of Abraham. You've been there. You've dealt with it. Let me remind you, not only has Abraham gone through it, but you know when our Lord Jesus experienced death, which he did. What does the Bible say? When one of his dear friends, Lazarus, passed away, it says that he what? He wept. The shortest verse of your Bible, Jesus wept and cried. Know that your Lord has also been in this spot. He's been there. He knows what you're going through. And I'll tell you, mourning and weeping is a proper response to death. Don't ever let anyone tell you that the stoic, no tears method is the way people of faith mourn. That is not the case. No, death has invaded our world through the fall, hasn't it? It should be odd, irregular. It should never have happened. It's tragic. And there is, as the Bible says, a time for sorrow and for weeping. But that sorrow and weeping, what it should do is it should make us thirst for a day when God is going to wipe away all of our tears. And there will be no more death, no more sickness, no more disease. And it should remind us to prepare for that day. And it's interesting, you know, the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon, said in the book of Ecclesiastes, if you ever had a choice to go to a funeral or to a party, 
he says this, it is better to go to the house of mourning than go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind and the living will lay it to heart. He says it's good to go to the funeral because what the funeral does is it reminds you that death is coming and you ought to prepare for it. I'll I'll remind all of you, this particular group that is here at Lebanon Baptist Church this morning, number one, we will probably not all be here this exact group again. But a year from now, you can almost guarantee it that someone in this room will be on the other side of eternity. You and I are going to have to deal with death. Some of you, it's going to come quicker than you can imagine. It's going to hit very close to home. God's people will encounter death. So, Pastor Brian, how did Abraham deal with it? Well, we learned he wept, he cried, he mourned. But it didn't stop there. The second truth we're going to get this morning is this. God's people can respond in faith. And that's what you're going to find Abraham do. Notice that now in the midst of all of his brokenness, Abraham knew that he had to keep living. He knew he had to keep taking another step, the next step in front of him. God had him there for a purpose, and he needed to continue himself to live by faith. You know what? It is in these times of death and heartache that you and I can be incredible testimonies of the grace of God. That we are people who know God. So he began to make his decisions based not simply on his sorrow, not simply on this life. He began to make his decisions, even in reference to her death, based on promises that God had given in the future. What we do, what we find in Genesis 23, the remainder of it, is really a business transaction. It's interesting, more time is devoted to this business transaction of finding a tomb for Sarah than for really her death and Abraham's mourning for her. One person said it this way, man's final requirement of man is a grave. And those of you who've had to sit in a funeral home and had to pick out a coffin or pick out a burial spot, it is the most awkward thing you could ever imagine. It should be out of place. It is out of place. It's hard. And here Abraham has to navigate it. He works through it. But you say, Pastor Brian, what was going through Abraham's mind at that time? You know what I believe was going through his mind? that God had promised one day to give him the land of Cana. He says, I'll give you a land. I'm going to give you, that's going to be the place of your ancestors. I will bless you. I will do all this. Up to that point, Abraham didn't possess it yet. He may have had a couple of wells that he laid claim to, But what would have been the normal scenario for Abraham in this particular situation? In a normal scenario, you take the body of your loved one back to their home country. That's what we do with our soldiers. That's what we do oftentimes with missionaries. They they serve the Lord and then they, they bring their bodies home if they pass away on the field. Wouldn't it have been, you could say, proper and just the unusual, the, the normal thing to do to go to take the body to Mesopotamia, back to Ur, and bury her there? Here what we find is that Abraham sees beyond this life. He doesn't see this being the end. He sees beyond it. He sees the promises of God, and he wants in many ways to have an eternal perspective. And so what he does is he goes to the inhabitants of the land that he was living in in order to purchase property for her burial spot. Look what it says in verse 3 and 4. It says, And Abraham rose up from before his dead and said to the Hittites, these are those who were dwelling in this area of Cana. He says, I am a sojourner and a foreigner among you. Give me, and notice he says, give me property among you as a burying place. 
that I may bury my dead out of my sight. So what we find through the rest of this chapter is we have a record of a very careful business proceeding. Now, when Abraham says, I want you to give me a a burying spot, it wasn't basically Abraham says, hey, I need a handout. Someone give me a place. I need someone to just give this to me. What he was really asking was, he was asking for one of them to sell him a piece of property. Now, just to kind of understand this, maybe a Something that would be helpful is what John Zimmer described to me about the Micronesian island that he serves on in Palau. In Palau, only Palauans are allowed to own the land. They're not allowed to sell it to anybody else. In fact, you can lease a piece of land on Palau for 99 years, but it's going to go back to the what? The family after that. So the land is tied to those particular people. Here, Abraham asked for special permission to purchase some land. He knew God had given it to him, but he wasn't going to, he had already tried to manipulate situations in the past. Here, he's trusting the Lord, but he's going to purchase some land. And here, Abraham respectfully requested. it. Now, Just as a side note, he identifies himself as a sojourner, sojourner, and a foreigner. He hadn't necessarily adopted their way of life, lived in their towns, took up their gods. He was different from all of them. He was someone who did not, in many ways, become like Lot, who infiltrated their particular area and adopted all of their mentality. He was different. He lived differently. And of course, the Israelites were supposed to do this when they got there. He tells us, you and I, that we need to make sure that we don't hold this life too dearly. You and I are to be strangers and pilgrims. In fact, Peter writes years later to us, he says, beloved, I urge you as sojourners and as exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage against your soul. And all of us, okay, you and I who live in the New Testament era, we are to continue to be strangers on this planet. This, as the, the song that we used to sing as kids, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. I'm just going through here. And Abraham, he lived, that was his testimony. Now notice how they respond. When he asks, they give their assessment of Abraham's testimony among them. Look what it says in verse 5. It says, the Hittites answered Abraham, hear us, my Lord. You are a prince of God among us. Bear your dead in the choicest of our tombs. None of us will withhold from you this tomb to hinder you from burying your dead. So what do they do? They call him a prince of God. Interesting. Remember Sarah, what does her name mean? Princess. He's the prince of God. But evidently, they noticed something different about him. He was a prince of El, of God. They noticed the blessing that God had given him. It was just clear to all of them who lived there, the prosperity and all that had happened to him. And what do they do? They say, take your choice of the burial spots. Then what Abraham does is he has a particular spot in mind. And so he asks for it. Look what it says in verse number seven. It says, Abraham rose and bowed to the Hittites. Notice his reference there. The people of the land. And and as I mentioned to you, it's going to continue to come up. Property, land, Cana. Because the focus here is he's getting a piece of this property by faith. It says in verse 8, and he said to them, if you are willing that I should buy or should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave at Machpelah, which he owns. It is at the end of his field. For the full price, let him give it to me in your presence as property for a burying spot. So he goes kind of the city. He's, He's in the where all the elders are sitting, he has a particular cave. He says, I want to buy the cave 
which is adjacent to this field. I just want to get the cave, and I'd, I'd like to, you to approach Ephron about getting this particular cave. So now Abraham begins the formal negotiations. Look what it says in verse 10. Now Ephron was sitting among the Hittites. And Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the hearing of the Hittites, of all who went in at the gate of his city. So they're all sitting there. They're all watching this. And by the way, the city gate, it's not just a metal gate. The city gate was kind of this area where a lot of the business transactions took place. And normally uh, some of the wise men and the leaders of the city just hung out in the city gate. Okay? And this is what happens. It says, verse 11, No, my Lord, hear me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of my people, I give it to you. Bury your dead. Then Abraham bowed down before the people of the land. And he said to Ephron in the hearing of the people of the land, But if you will, hear me. I give the price of the field. Accept it from me that I may bury my dead there. Ephron answered Abraham, My Lord, listen to me. A piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. Abraham listened to Ephron, and Abraham weighed out for Ephron the silver that he had named in the hearing of the Hittites. 400 shekels of silver according to the weights current among the merchants. Now, as I just read that story, it is here that you and I can inadvertently read through our modern Western glasses and assume the deal went down a certain way. Here's a question for you. Was this a picture of Ephron's great generosity? Or was this a very shrewd and careful business transaction? Now, for most of us, it at first appears to, it it did for me, as if Ephron was like, hey, I'll just give it to you. I'll just give you my field. You can just, and and Abraham responds, no, I, I can't take your field. Let me pay for it. And Ephron says, oh, what's this little amount between you and me? 400 shekels of weight. And Abraham says, I'll pay it. You gave me the number, I'll pay it, and the deal's done. However, let me paint it for you, I believe, in the correct light. Ephron didn't want to sell simply the cave adjoining his field. The business transaction is... Abraham wants the cave, and Ephron says, oh, I'm I'm, I'm throwing in the field. And he says this in verse 11. He says, no, my Lord, hear me. Now listen to me. I give you the field, and I give you the cave that is in it. In the sight of the sons of uh, of my people, I give it to you, bury your dead. Now, when Ephron says, I give it to you, you know what all of us, most of us do? Oh, he's just going to give it to him. How sweet, how kind, how nice. Give, in their day, and in this transaction, had strings attached, attached to it. It was like this. I give you that, you give me something else. It's kind of like, hey, you be really gracious. I give it to you, but you better be giving me something back. You say, uh, really, Pastor Brian, is that really what's, what's going on? I mean, I'll just tell you, as I've traveled in the Middle East, and there have been times, even currently, where what they do, sometimes even merchants, they hand you. I give to you. I give. And then if you, stupid tourist, oh, thank you, and you start walking away, oh, Now you have to give me $100 for that. I give, you give. This was the proper way of doing a transaction. And let me tell you, Abraham knew what was going on. And he knew he needed to get this piece of property, but he had to be, he had to go with their culture and understand what was going on. This was a business deal. 
And what happens here is this, Ephron threw out the starting price at 400 shekels. We'll go down to verse 14 again. It says, Ephron answered Abraham, my Lord, listen to me, a piece of land worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that between you and me? Bury your dead. That wasn't, hey, this is such a little tiny amount. What's that? It's basically saying, hey, 400 shekels, you know what 400 shekels of silver was? Let me just give you an idea. A thousand years later, inflation, the entire Temple Mount was bought for 600 shekels, so only 200 more. What you're finding here, and I'll put it this way, it was like a used car dealer taking this car and he's giving the most inflated amount. Hey, 400 shekels, that shouldn't be hard between you and me. He knew how rich Abraham was. But it's interesting. Surprisingly, Abraham accepts the offer right away. He doesn't bargain. He doesn't, oh, you're trying to cheat me. You're trying to do this because he's trying to get that piece of land as a testimony. So what does he do? He measures the silver. At that time, they didn't necessarily have silver coins, and so they had pieces and chunks of silver, and they weighed it according to the measurements of that particular day. He, he did it, and he did it in front of all the people. So all the Hittites and all the people in the city, and everybody knew that land was now Abraham's. He had purchased it and done it. And in verse 17 and 18, you see like the, uh, it's just the classic sealing of the deal. It says in verse 17, so the field of Ephron and Machpelah, which was to the east of Mamre, the field with the cave that is in it and all the trees that were in the field. In fact, in Hittite documents, ancient Near Eastern documents, when there were business contracts, they always included the trees with it. Throughout the whole area was made over to Abraham as a possession in the presence of the Hittites before all who went in at the gate of the city. So, Pastor Brian, the question is this. Why does God, I mean, when you think about Abraham's life, there was probably great things that happened, all of this stuff. Why does God spend all of these verses recounting this particular event? I submit to you, The main point of all this is that Abraham, by faith, with one eye on the promises of God, one eye on having to deal with life, he bought property in Cana as a testimony to what God said he would do. He is going to give us this land. There is more to this life than than what I'm seeing. There is an eternal part of this. I believe what God has said. In fact, years later, Jeremiah when the, the country of Judah was being pulled into captivity, God told Jeremiah to do a very unusual thing. He said, Jeremiah, I want you to go buy property. He says, but everyone's going into exile. The property's going to be worth nothing. He says, go buy property because one day we're all coming back here and I want you to do it by faith. And what Abraham does here is he does it by faith. And notice it repeatedly refers to property, location, Cana. It does it in the last two verses. It says this, after this, Abraham buried Sarah, his wife, in the cave of the field of Machpelah, east of Mamre. That is it, he is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. The field and the cave that is in it were made over to Abraham as property. For the burying place by the Hittites. And in fact, did you know that you and I could visit Sarah's tomb even to this day in Hebron? In fact, not only is Sarah buried there, but Abraham would be buried there. And Isaac and his wife and Jacob and his wife. And they would all do it by faith. What what this was was this. This was Abraham before God and before all the people and before future generations saying this, I am somebody who believes in the promises of God. Life doesn't end here. There is so much more going on. 
and I want to show the generation, and I want to, by faith, live according to something more is coming. One commentator said it this way, by leaving their bones in Canaan, the patriarch gave their last witness to the promise. In fact, years later, the writer of Hebrews would say this about Abraham and Sarah. It says this, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them and greeted them from afar. And having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth, for people who speak thus, those who speak this way, make it clear that they are seeking a what? A homeland a city not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. They are ones who look beyond this life. And Abraham was a guy, a man of God, who looked past death at eternity. Do you see beyond this life? Do you have eyes? And do you have your actions that... Shout to the world that there is more to this life than this life. It is our actions, particularly around death, that can point people to faith in God's promises. I remember right when I started as a pastor, I was uh, just green in ministry. One of the gentlemen that I worked for as a high school student, I painted his fences on his property When he passed away, his family didn't go to church, and the only kind of preacher they knew was me. And they asked me to do his funeral. He he died very suddenly in his early 50s in a car accident, and I don't believe he ever knew Christ. He, He went his own way. And I can still remember being asked to preach the funeral, and even just the, it was an incredibly hot day in August, a tent on their piece of property, They were weeping, they were crying, but it was almost like this was the end. He was cremated, they threw his remains in the lake that I had often fished in. But the statement there is it's done, it's over. We hope maybe something, maybe there's something out there. It's a stark difference From as I look across this room, some of you who've lost loved ones, when you've buried your loved one, it is a statement of your faith in Christ. God, you are going to resurrect this person one day. And I will not weep as other people weep who have no hope but I have promises that God has given me. And even through the midst of death, I will continue to take steps forward. So you say, Pastor Brian, so what? What does this mean for me? 2020. You ought to make all your decisions in this life with one eye, at least, on eternity. You ought to, when you make your decisions about your education, is it all for you or is one eye on eternity and the promises of God? When you select the job that you're going to take, Are you going to select a job with one eye on eternity and the promises of God? Let's say you have this new promotion. Or maybe it's a move to move to this area. All your decisions ought to be somebody whose eyes are not just on this life. There's an eye on the hereafter. When it comes to your money and the way you invest it, Could people look at your checkbook or your check registry or your online account and say, you know what? It looks like they're having to deal with two things. They're having to deal with life, but they're also investing in the eternal. You know what? What we truly believe here is often really revealed in times of death. How we weep, how we hurt. The most important thing that any of you can do to prepare for that is what you do with Jesus Christ. Jesus, God's final word to this planet, said this repent and believe the gospel. 
You have to believe that Jesus Christ indeed is the God of the universe and the only way to have all your sins forgiven is by depending on him and him alone to be your sinless sacrifice. And of course, what do we know about Jesus? Not only did he die on the cross for the sins of the world, but he resurrected on the third day and he's alive today. And he will take away all your sin and credit to your account his righteousness if you believe. You have to do that. Today is the day of salvation. Believe in him. Specifically, when navigating the death of a loved one, have hope. Even when planning your own funeral, keep your eyes on eternity. Point others to it. Historically, you know what? The testimony of saints has been to be careful with the care of the body. Oftentimes, it's been through burial. Uh, you, you find kind of the history of the church. They're careful with the bones. You see Joseph say, take my bones back to, take them back to Cana. And then there's the care of the body. It's a testimony for the future. Of course, in our day, you and I who live, and there's a lot of decisions when it comes to uh, burial, cremation, and we know that even financially, it's, it's an incredibly difficult decision these days. Historically, it's been the testimony, as I said, of the saints to bury their dead. Uh, that particularly is my preference, my opinion. When I die, I, I'd want my body to be buried in some ways as a testimony. We know and are confident that God will resurrect everybody. My grandpa was cremated. Some of my dearest family members were cremated. We know the Bible says he will resurrect everybody. And you will either stand with him forever in eternity or you will stand at the final judgment and be sentenced to death. He will resurrect everybody. But one of the testimonies of the saints has been, God's going to do something again with this body. Think about how you even plan your estate afterwards. What do you do with your money when you're leaving here? Are you someone who thinks in reference to how can I further eternity? That ought to be something you consider and not be flippant. Here you spend your whole entire life raising and building a nest egg and thinking, God, how can I further your work? That's a testimony for they live for something different. Those who live by faith must use their life and their death to declare their faith in future glory. This isn't the end. And I'll tell you, this wasn't the end of Abraham and Sarah. You say, how do you know that? Because years later, our Lord, when he's answering questions one day in Jerusalem and they're saying, and there were a lot of people who doubted whether people actually resurrected from the dead. Jesus Christ shut their mouths when he answered their question about, hey, what about the resurrection of the dead? Listen to what he says in Matthew 22. He says, and as for the resurrection of the dead, are people really going to rise from the dead? Jesus looks at the teachers of that day, the scribes. He says, have you not read what it is said to you by God? He, he quotes scripture. And how God said this, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And then Jesus says this, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And what he was stating here is this, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, at that very moment as he was talking, guess what, what they were doing? They were living. And the crowd heard it, and they were astonished at his teaching. You know what? There is something beyond this life, and Jesus confirmed it. And you and I need to keep our eyes on it. So how do you deal with death? You're going to have to. Let me encourage you to do it by faith. By faith. God's people live by faith in the face of death. That's what God's people do. So let me encourage all of you, you better prepare for it. It's coming. I have, I think I've referred to this one other time in my time at Lebanon Baptist Church, I have in front of you a piece of paper that uh, there's a photocopy of two different, you could say, documents. It was a number of years ago, I traveled on an evangelistic team 
called the Minutemen Team, and we'd go to different cities, and we would go and host a three-night kind of youth activity, and they'd preach, and we'd preach the gospel every night. And I was in Newington, Connecticut, hosting this big event when a young man who I invited uh, to the event to be a part of my team came and after the first night went up to the main speaker and told him this. He says, you know what? I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God, but you got me thinking tonight. You got me thinking tonight. He came back the next night and then he came back the third night. It was interesting. On the third night, we normally had a testimony time before the preaching and he got in line to take do a testimony. And I was kind of like man in the line, like, okay, uh, you got to have a testimony in order to give a testimony. Well, long story short, Jeff Mashrell that night turned from his atheism and he accepted Christ. And in fact, I have Jeff Mashrell on April the 12th filled out this decision slip. In fact, he wrote in his own words, he said that the question was, would you explain in your own words what Jesus Christ has done for you tonight? And he said this, he grabbed hold of my heart and just flowed through me, making me almost feel like I could glow. That was his way of putting it. So he came to Christ, evidently. On the top of this sheet, is an obituary. I told you he was saved on April the 12th. Obituary. Jeff M. Mashrell, 17, of his address, died Saturday, April 13th. He was hit by an automobile and sent out into eternity. But let me tell you, if indeed Jeff Mashrell placed his faith in Christ, he prepared for his death by faith. You know what, you and I, none of us know for sure when that day is going to come. I've treasured this. God can radically change a person. So you better prepare for your death. But those of you who have prepared it, then you need to look beyond it. Don't just prepare for it. Look beyond it and make all your decisions based on that. Seek a country that is beyond it, a building without hands, eternal in the heavens, and live by faith and not by sight. Let's pray.